Welcome to To The Point. In Lansing, the state legislature is done for the year with a mixed bag of results. With lessening but continuing divisions and billions of dollars of federal stimulus money to spend, there will be plenty of challenges in the new year. East Lansing Democrat Senator Curtis Hertel Jr. takes a look back and looks ahead to 2022. Senator, I want to start with a little bit of perspective. I was talking to the governor last week and was talking about perspective and it's hard to come by in this unusual time, but you have a unique look at Lansing from your father to your brother sure. to your service. You've got a long history. How unusual have the past 20 months or how difficult have the past 20 months been to try to get consensus, try to get people to work together? Because I know there's been a lot of upheaval, but there's also been some pretty remarkable success that we'll talk about in a minute when we talk about some of the budgeting things that I would have never anticipated. What's it been like? It's been difficult. You know, um, I think every time is unique in the Michigan legislature. Um, you know, my dad served in probably one of the most unique times when there were 55 Republicans and 55 Democrats in the State House, and they had to come up with an agreement. And everyone talks about the, it was one of the most productive sessions uh, in history and how well they got along, and all that's true. What they don't necessarily talk about is the two months before that where they beat the hell out of each other. Uh, my dad gave a speech on the floor of the house about uh, 20 pieces of silver comparing somebody to Judas. Uh, Paul Hilligans uh, at one point uh, hung up the phone at home and his uh, kids asked if, uh, if Democrats were people. Uh, so there, are, there have been tough times in the past. Um, I think that this, um, certainly the country has grown uh, more partisan in different directions. Uh, certainly, um, I never could have imagined what happened on uh, January 6th and the insurrection. Um, you know, one thing we've always counted on in democracy is that everyone agrees that at the end of an election, the election's over. And uh, we say the other person won fairly because they did, and we move on. And certainly some of that poison from Washington has seeped into the Michigan legislature. And certainly COVID has not helped. It's helped. It's not helped in a couple ways. One, we spend less time together. And uh, the legislature is about relationships. And, um, you know, my career has worked uh, largely because I'm able to create friendships on both sides of the aisle. Um, and I think it's, it's harder to maintain those friendships and certainly harder to create new ones when people don't spend those actual time, time together. It's one of the reasons why I think term limits have been a disaster as well, uh, because we just don't get to know each other in the same way. Um, so uh, do I believe that this has been uh, one of the least productive sessions in probably Michigan's history? The answer is yes. But at the same time, we have come up, come up with some pretty big deals uh, in terms of budgetary things. And certainly this is a, uh, what happened last this week is a good reflection of that. Um, we still have hundreds of millions, uh, I'm sorry, we have billions of dollars in ARPA dollars that have been appropriated that we haven't actually spent and there are some real priorities we need to get to work on. Uh, but I am uh, do believe that there are some positive things that happened this week and I'm proud of that. I want to talk about that in a moment, <clears throat> but I want to talk about the regular budgeting process first yes. because the largest single school aid fund ever passed um, and as a reporter, I don't make a judgment about good and bad, but within that, there was a promise that was made two and a half decades ago that was fulfilled in parity for school funding. I think th I, that's got to be a big deal. I'll tell you this. The, the largest is important, but I'd also remind you that almost every year we have the largest school aid budget. But that, this was this that, larger by far. By far, but that, that's part of it. The bigger thing, I think, absolutely, is a couple things. Uh, the equity that was actually put in among school districts is a promise that was made 20 years ago that was finally fulfilled. Uh, and this governor uh, fought tooth and nail to make sure that happened. Uh, it, 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 it wasn't something that only happened in Republican districts or Democratic districts. Uh, it, it, the, the inequity happened throughout the state. And this is a huge investment in those schools, and that's incredibly important. It also was the largest in history investment in student mental health. And I think that's a huge issue that I think uh, probably went underreported actually at the time. Um, in, the, in, in our country, uh, the number two cause of death among adolescents is suicide. It is the only one going up. 
Uh, it, it is not something that's new because of COVID. It happened well before that. Um, it's a difficult time for, for, for kids. Uh, COVID certainly um, made that worse, but, it, but it's always been hard. Uh, you know, when, when, when we were going to school, um, maybe you were bullied, maybe things happened, but uh, when you left the school building, you had a safe place at home. That doesn't exist any longer because of cell phones and all the different um, social medias and all those things. The bullying never stops for the, some of these kids. Um, and so uh, this is a huge, was a huge investment in that, and I'm incredibly proud uh, of what was able to be accomplished there. We also... Um, in the final budget, we're able to get uh, important funding for uh, mental health services as well. Um, we have a project that I'm working on here in Lansing, the, the old McLaren Hospital uh, is going to be uh, transferred over to uh, youth crisis beds. This is something we really have a huge problem with. Uh, kids that are in crisis have very few places to go. We have Pine Rest over on your side of the state, which is a wonderful place. Uh, but a lot of those kids end up out of state because there just isn't, aren't enough beds for them. Uh, most of the time they end up in an emergency room tied for weeks. We heard that several cases of that that got public, but those cases most often don't get public because the, the families don't want to talk about what's happening with their kids. Um, they don't want to embarrass the kid, and, they don't, and so it's not something we talk about. Mental health is always that problem, really, the stigma associated with it. So um, there were really important investments in that as well. There were big, great things that got done. Um, uh, maybe some of the smaller stuff didn't get done, but I do believe that this governor has uh, found a way in very, very difficult times uh, to work with the other, other side of the aisle and find ways to get things done. It may not be the thing that gets the most attention because the loudest people are often the people that get nothing done. Um, but I think that the governor and the, the work that we were able to do working on those issues is incredibly important. You mentioned a minute ago that there was a lot of money that's yet to be spent. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, historical spending. Uh, talk to me about some of your priorities. Obviously, you're a voice of one, but yeah. uh, what are the, the things that you would like to see with your experience in, in appropriations and, and looking at this unique opportunity for one-time spending? You know, it's funny, the thing we just talked about in terms of mental health, the project that we're doing here in Lansing is great and it's, it's mostly paid for. But that same project could be done across the state. Um, we can have partnerships with Spectrum in uh, Grand Valley. We can have partnerships uh, in Ann Arbor uh, with the hospital and the university. Uh, we can do it in northern Michigan. Um, the, and the reason why it's so important to have a college partner is because we have two problems when it comes to mental health space. We don't have enough beds which is important, and we don't have enough staffing. And the problem is, is those two point to each other. We don't build new beds because we don't have the staffing for it. We don't build more staff because we don't have the beds. And we never solve the problem because we just keep pointing at the two different problems and never solving either of them. This actually helps solve that because you actually are building, uh, working with the university, that staff and experience as you go. So you, we can actually solve the major problem that we have with teen crisis beds, solve uh, the staffing issues and create the beds at the same time and a place for people to go. So, so that's a unique opportunity that we can solve. Uh, we certainly have seen flooding and water problems throughout the state. We've seen lead uh, pipes poisoning children in lots of communities. Uh, we have seen uh, you know, huge problems with workforce. We need better training and opportunities for Michigan's families. Uh, these are all things we can solve. The, the, the funny thing is, is that all those things I just said our priorities for Democrats and Republicans in the legislature and the governor. We don't have a problem with ideas. We don't have a problem with how the money should be spent. We have a problem with getting in a room and actually negotiating and getting it spent. There is no point where the Michigan families benefit from a, us holding $6 billion from Washington, D.C. and Michigan's coffers. No one wants to see, nobody benefits, nobody wants to see Lansing holding that money. Uh, we need to get this money out the door, and we need to get politics out of the way. At the end of the day, um, most people don't care if Republicans or Democrats are winning in Lansing. It's not an interesting thing for them. What they care about is their own family. You know, if their kid is, uh, has trouble, is there a place for them to go to help? Uh, can they find the training for the next job that they want? Uh, can they put food on their table? Is their kid's school uh, the best uh, place that it can be? Those are what they actually care about. Is their road to work fixed, you know? Those, all those things. We have the money to solve all those problems. And so sometimes, um, because 
elections coming up. Um, there, you know, one of the reasons why things I think have been so slow is that they're worried about giving the governor wins. At the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter if the governor's winning or if Republicans are winning or if Democrats are winning. It matters if Michigan's people are winning. And that's where our responsibility is. And I'm tired sometimes of the election discussions getting in the way of what actually is best for Michigan's people. Well, it's a big election year, and you're right. There will be that that will seep in. But you talked about some successes even this past week. And you, you hear the conversation, or at least I hear, I won't put it on you, but I hear the governor talking in different tones when she talks about working with the legislature. Obviously, the budgets have to have been a success, despite the fact it took a while to get it done, but there was a whole lot to deal with, a lot of money and a lot of different issues. Absolutely. Uh, have things gotten better since you could look out this window and see the streets filled with people who were protesting COVID restrictions and, and some of the rhetoric then? Has that cooled off a bit? Uh, listen, I still think the divide is out there, but I, but I do think that um, there are, there are some of us that have been able to look past the divide to actually go and get things done. And that's the way it has to be. Um, uh, you know, uh, the only time in my life that I've ever been uh, afraid at the Capitol building uh, was the, those protest days when, you know, we had people literally with guns standing above us uh, in the Senate uh, being threatened on the way into the building. Th those were the hardest times, I think, for any of us to serve. Um, and certainly uh, the threats on the governor's life uh, and her family were serious. Um, do I think those things have passed? Somewhat. Um, I will say that they are still stoked sometimes in some of our committees. We had a hearing on vaccines where, you know, every crazy theory was thrown out there, including that, um, you know, I mean, I can't even get into, I mean, all, all, all the different theories, I guess. Um, but uh, I still think there's some people out there stoking the big lie and stoking um, fears that are uh, baseless about vaccines and those things. Um, we certainly live in a state where uh, we, we have a significant portion of people that are in the hospital dying of COVID still, uh, a clear majority of them that are unvaccinated. Um, it would be nice if we could all get together on the same message on those things. Um, so do I think it's better than it was? Yes. Um, do I worry still about some of the effects we've had on people, people that don't believe in the democracy any longer because they think elections are stolen, uh, people that don't believe in science any longer and feel um, they, they, they won't take what is basic medical advice to protect themselves? Yeah, I worry about that a lot. When we come back, our conversation with Senator Curtis Hertel Jr. continues as he gives us his thoughts on how to keep kids safe in school in light of the Oxford school shooting. That's next to the point. Welcome back to to the point. Senator Curtis Hertel is in his second and final term in the upper chamber. We talked with him about a wide range of subjects, including keeping kids safe in school. We have to discuss the continuing surge. Uh, the hospital beds yes. uh, in many areas in the state uh, are hospitals are at 110, 120, 130 percent capacity. We know people are still getting very sick. Uh, largely here, still the Delta variant, that we have other variants Absolutely. that are coming in. And we are a year after the first vaccine was administered in this country, and still there are fully 30% of the people in the state, perhaps more, that are not fully vaccinated. Does the state have any other card to play to help to convince people? Because there's been a lot done. There were monetary incentives. Sure. We've talked about it, you know, for all of this time, for those who aren't vaccinated, is there anything governmentally that can be done to encourage them to that you haven't done? You know, this is what I can tell you. Uh, Canada was way behind the United States in terms of vaccines. And uh, because they didn't have the manufacturing that we had, and uh, when they got enough vaccines to finally vaccinate their country, they passed the United States in a matter of a couple months. Uh, why did, were they able to do that? Largely it was because they were able to have both parties stand up and say the vaccine is safe, the vaccine is effective, the best thing you can do to protect your family is to get the vaccine. And so leaders stood up and said what is the most basic truth that is inarguable, the vaccines save lives and they're the safest thing you can do. Here's what we know here in Michigan right now. If you looked at uh, Michigan hospitals, 70% uh, of those that are in the hospital with COVID right now 
are unvaccinated. Um, which, as you just stated, only 30% of the population is unvaccinated. So if you know that 70% of those people that are in the hospital are unvaccinated and they come out of only 30% of the population, it's an inarguable math that the vaccine is keeping people out of the hospitals. 85% of the people that are on vents are unvaccinated. Again, much smaller portion of the population, they are the ones that are on vents. Uh, and almost no deaths have come from, from anyone who has been vaccinated twice and also got the booster. Um, we have found zero hospital deaths on this point on that. The vaccine isn't perfect. No vaccines are. Actually, nothing is perfect, I and mean, that's part of the problem. There's a, a legal amount of uh, everything, right? There's a legal amount of mercury in fish. Uh, there's a legal, legal, a legal amount of uh, rat poop in chocolate. Every, nothing's perfect. But the best thing that we know to tell people to save lives, what we know by the math, what we know by the science, is that the vaccine makes you less likely to go to the hospital, makes you less likely to end up on a vent, and makes you less likely to die in significant proportions. And if we could get everyone in the legislature and leadership to say those words, I think that would help. Short of that, I don't know how to do it because it's become all political. You know, President Trump, the one thing that he should get the most credit for, I think, of the entire four years is the speed of the vaccine. I think Pro Project Warp Speed is something that they should be celebrating. But unfortunately, he got up and said one time that, and took credit for it and said people should get vaccinated, he got booed off the stage. So uh, it, it, it's gonna take a, a massive amount. They have to turn a giant uh, boat around that they led down this direction. Um, and it's gonna take all of them speaking in unison in order to do that. But it's the right thing for the state. And that's what should happen. I wanna talk about something that hits close to home, I, I think for every person in the state. We saw the horrific school shootings that happened. And since then, I have watched in the legislature and there has been some movement to try to take action to help prevent these type of things from happening that happen with regularity in the United States. There was an extra $40 million added to a bill that would put $50 million towards school resource officers. Yeah. There are other efforts among people in the legislature to take action. What is your your best take on some activity that can help keep kids safe in school? You know, um, there are certainly things that um, we can do that what you talked about in terms of things on the fringes. The one thing I will say is that um, these tragedies happen all too often and they honestly are a almost singularly American event. We don't see them happen in other places. And the, the problem I always have after these things happen is that the first conversation that we always have is what we won't do. So everyone gets in their political corners and says, uh, well, the discussion can't be about guns or the discussion can't be about this. In the reality, uh, in order to solve a problem, you can't start by saying that you won't do certain things to solve it. You have to look at the problem as a whole. I believe in the Second Amendment. I believe people have a right to bear arms. But I also believe in uh, that there's a responsibility that comes with every single right. And the Heller decision, uh, Justice Scalia wrote, and he's by no means a liberal, uh, wrote that there are reasonable restrictions that are allowed for guns in this country. Um, I don't know if there are any perfect law that would have stopped the tragedy from happening or any one specific tragedy. But what I do know is that there are reasonable things that most of us can agree on. Most of us, in, if you look at polling, most of us agree that uh, guns don't belong in schools, they don't belong in churches. Most of us agree that uh, there should be certain limits on high capacity magazines and uh, certain weapons. Most of us agree that if you own a gun, you should keep it locked up in your home and, it should, and 15 year old kids shouldn't have access to it. Most of us believe in red flag laws that if someone has a history of mental illness or a history of threats that we should be keeping a better eye on those people and they shouldn't have access to weapons. Those are not liberal positions. Those are positions that most people agree with. The problem that we have is that the rhetoric around guns gets so high every time something happens that we start the conversation with, we're gonna, we, we can't do any of these things. 
I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's fair to those families. I don't think it's fair to my kids. You know, somebody asked me, um, you know, what advice do I have for my children when they're going to school the next day? The reality is that when you go into uh, your, putting your kids off the of school that next day, they know better than I do how to hack or handle an active shooter situation. They have had to live their entire lives getting trained on how to deal with active shooters. I don't have any advice for them. I hug them and I hope that they'll be safe when they get there. And none of us should have to live with that. None of us should have to live like that with our kids. And they shouldn't have, and our kids shouldn't have to live in a world where they have to go through the trainings if some horrific thing happens to them. It's, it's, I think it's part of the mental health problem if you really want to get into it because we scare the heck out of kids. But it's a reality of what they actually have to live with. Uh, so uh, I don't have any good advice for my kids. I give them a hug and I hope they're okay. And that, as a parent, is an awful feeling and I would hope that all of us could take that feeling and imagine how that felt for those families as their kids were locked in classrooms with guns flying around, with bullets flying around, um, and stop the conversation about what we won't do and start the conversation with what we will. Senator Hertel has a piece of legislation that's headed to the governor, and he'll talk about that next. To the point. Senator Curtis Hertel was one of the major movers behind online sports betting here in Michigan, and he now has another piece of legislation that involves the outcome of some of that betting. The final moments that we have, I want to talk about something that has become a phenomenon, and uh, you are not singularly responsible for it, but you certainly have a hand in it, and that's sports books. Yeah. Uh, uh, online and you you've got a couple of bills uh, that you're working on r right now that would deal with taxation and uh, gambling debts and another w that would deal uh, that could impact uh, horse tracks around yes. the state. Talk first about uh, deducting gambling debt. Uh, first of all I think that uh, sports gaming has been a, a tremendous success uh, for Michigan. Uh, we're gonna have more money invested in our schools and uh, we, we I was really proud this uh, Earlier this year, we were able to expand coverage of, uh, of cancer protections for firefighters based on the fund that we created as part of sports gaming. Sports gaming is going to be uh, fantastic uh, for, for those reasons. Uh, but when you make a bet and you lose, uh, you know, like if you bet on the Lions, for example, which is a, you know, a bad idea, but often people do it. Uh, under federal law, under every other state law, your wins and your losses are figured out at the end of the year and you owe taxes based on uh, the difference between those two. Uh, so if you bet, you know, 100 bucks a week and you end up up 500 bucks, Michigan should tax you just like the federal government does. But under Michigan law, before we actually passed what was in the House last week, uh, my bill, uh, you would get taxed even if you lost. So you, you, you bet, 500 bucks, you lost a thousand dollars, you owe taxes still on the $500. Well, there's no other place in the tax code. Rich people, when they sell a stock, if they sell it for a loss, they can write off the, the loss of the capital gains. Uh, businesses get to write off their losses as well. Why should we tell the, the person who uh, is just having a little fun that they should pay taxes even when they lose? No, we just don't do that anywhere else in, in, in uh, government. Uh, we certainly should tax people when they, when, when they win. We have the highest casino gaming tax in the country, so we actually tax the corporations that are doing these things a lot of money, and that's great because it's money for our schools and it, uh, helping, uh, helping firefighters with cancer. But we shouldn't hurt the little guy. Uh, and so what my bill basically says is that you're able to write off your losses. Not more than you made, not off your other income, just losses in gambling versus your wins. You, you, you win, uh, you know, you, 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 you lose money for the year, you don't get taxed on it. You win money for the year, you get taxed on it. It just seems like basic fairness. And then you have another piece of legislation, and this one is more complicated from my perspective because I don't quite understand the horse sure. racing machines, but uh, this potentially could help uh, the real in-person horse racing. Listen, we, we used to be a great state for horse racing. If you look at, um, you know, what used to be Muskegon, Great Lakes Downs, or... Uh, if you look at the Detroit, uh, what used to be the Detroit Fairgrounds, uh, uh, Seabiscuit when uh, was injured and was training, Seabiscuit actually, the, a lot of the recovery work was done right at the Detroit Fairgrounds. There's a plaque down there that, that shows where it was. 
Um, it used to be a big part of, of what Michigan was. Uh, now we have one track operating, no thoroughbred tracks here in Michigan. Um, the thoroughbred industry is actually growing across the country. Um, the pandemic actually helped, so we have people actually that want to bet on, on horses again. Uh, we should be part of that. The, the bet, so what our bill does is allow for other tools. When you look at even the great tracks like Churchill and they have other tools uh, that help actually pay for all the cost of horse racing. The problem is that horse racing is an expensive sport. Um, it's good for us that it's an expensive sport because it means that every dollar you bet into horse racing, you're not just helping the horses or the track owners. It's the guy who walks the horses in the morning, the guy who grows the alfalfa uh, to feed the horse, uh, the person who builds the trailers that transports them. You have a huge industry that's surrounding that one thing. Uh, and so this is a uh, unique opportunity to bring horse racing back to Michigan. Uh, they're going to need extra tools to do so. Um, but the casinos make a lot of money. I think they can, you know, worry a little bit less about that money for a minute and try to help out this other industry. Um, so it's something that we're fighting for, and uh, I'm a passionate believer uh, in horse racing, and I believe that it would be great for Michigan to have it back. That's all the time we have today. We'll be back next week. To the point.